Hey y'all, I'm in the psychedelic room uh, with the, the uh, light bulb that changes colors and uh, adds to the trippy atmosphere of this video. Um, and uh, I'm going to be starting with these, uh, starting on these Q and A's. Um, now, this is something that I haven't done in a while, ever since I got a thousand viewers or a thousand uh, friends or followers or whatever they call them uh, on, on YouTube. I was able to, I've been able to do live casts. And since I started, since I was doing this sort of in lieu of being able to do a live cast early on with this new channel, which of course I had an old channel that had over five, over 4,000 um, friends or, or viewers or followers or whatever, but it, it got <clears throat> nuked by YouTube. So I've, I've had to pull myself up by my bootstraps, and even now, uh, it's nowhere near. It's, it's only a shadow uh, of the, of the uh, audience that I once had, but I guess the view counts are mm, sort of similar to what I used to have. But I realized that with these Q&As, they're, you know, um, it, it kind of gave an opportunity to respond to uh, or to give some of y'all more of a chance to ask me stuff uh, whereas on live streams you know it's just whoever happens to be there uh you know and whatever they happen to be and then it's usually a pretty small group of people um you know uh, it's fine everybody who shows up for my live cast i'm i'm thankful for all of you but uh but i thought this would be, be a way to cast the net a little wider so I'm going to begin with the oldest and move to the newest. So, um, first question, what is your opinion on Trumpenstein theory? This is something I had to have explained to me, but uh, let's see if I can bring up the explanation here. Okay. Okay, so the idea of the Trumpenstein theory is the theory that Trump is an amalgamation by the elite serve a mixed but necessary purpose. It's an idea Don Jeffries came up with. I don't know who Don Jeffries is. Or maybe maybe I did but forgot. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people keep track of these days. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it seems, it seems probable, not just possible, probable that this is that this that this describes uh, Trump's true identity because I've um, I've always found it strange that this man who was in the public eye since the eighties you know since like the early eighties he was this real estate mogul uh, who who was on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous and and you know became just this this face of the the um, I don't know, the rich guy, the mogul, you know, he was very New York. He was, he was like, a, uh, this, this sort of personality for, for much of my life from the eighties. And then so, so like from the eighties up to, tw up through 2014, he was basically this apolitical, uh, you know, just uh, sort of celebrity, um, you know, was on went on Oprah went on you know what was did did cameos in in uh, on sitcoms was in one of the Home Alone movies uh, you know had his his reality TV show The Apprentice uh, and and all that time he was he was he was just he was not a divisive figure at all he was just a, you know a sort of larger than life. Uh, you know, New, New York uh, rich guy mogul. Uh, you know, who who uh, who just who said what you know said what was on his mind, and and uh, you know was was uh, was gruff and tough, and and uh, uh, you know that that sort of thing. I mean, some people thought he was obnoxious, but nobody really hated him per se. You know, for for being a hateful racist bigot far right winger uh 
that that was that all changed in 2015, and I found that really peculiar. Uh, that that there was this, he had this makeover, and suddenly he was this divisive political figure who was loved by half the country and hated by half the country. Um, so, yeah, the idea that there's more going on than meets the eye with this guy seems seems quite quite likely. Um, and the idea of Trump as the outsider never I never understood. Like that, they were trying to pitch Trump as outsider. He was, he's he's always been part of a, you know, he 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 was part of a wealthy and influential family. Um, uh, you know, he 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 grew up wealthy. Um, so, you know, and, and he was he always had a lot of a lot of media influence. So. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, I mean, you never. You never know. We don't know anything about these guys. That's why we shouldn't. We shouldn't ever really trust them. Um, you know, trust people in your family. Trust people. Trust your friends that you know. Uh, don't trust these people who are just on TV or uh, on the internet and 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 uh, you know, uh, posture in, in one way or another. So I think it's possible that, that that's true. It's quite possible that uh, Trumpenstein, Trumpenstein theory is true. Okay, next question. You mentioned having some Norwegian and... Oh, uh, I'll identify these people. That was uh, JTR1976. This is uh, uh, Rav, Ravnaguten... Um, and Ravna Guten says, you mentioned having some Norwegian ancestry once. Where did your folks come from? My, uh, my Norwegian ancestry is all on my mother's side. My mother's maiden name was Anderson, um, and I was never, it was never quite clear to me whether it was Anderson S-O-N or Anderson S-E-N. Because I've seen it, I've actually seen it written both ways. I always preferred S E N because that was more exotic uh, and cooler somehow than, than S O N. But in any case, um, I am a quarter Norwegian on my maternal side. Um, my mother was born. Well, well she, I don't know where I'm not sure where she was born, but she lived she lived her childhood in a small town about an hour outside of Milwaukee in in the state of Wisconsin, a, a, a town called Whitewater. And my dad grew up in in Milwaukee. And my dad is of uh, Polish and Italian ancestry. My mom was of Norwegian, English, German uh, ancestry. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's the answer to that question. Uh, I, I would, I would add that I think that, you know, my, my experience in going to traveling to Wisconsin as, as we did as a family, um, uh, my, my parents and I, uh, and our dog, and that was it. Cause I didn't have any, any siblings. I was an only child, but during all of my childhood, we, we, we went to Wisconsin every Christmas and every summer. So twice a year, I would go and see both my dad's side and my mom's side of the family. And they were, they were a marked contrast, as you can imagine. One side being uh, Polish, Italian, working class, urban, uh, and uh, the, others, the others being, you know, more staid, uh, you know, uh, middle class, uh, 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 again, Norwegian slash English slash German, um, but the uh, um, if you go or or if you if you live, <laughs> I mean, I say if you go if you go there, like it's some like it's necessarily a place that you would travel to. It was for me, but if you live in in small towns and. 
in uh, Wisconsin or or Michigan or or Minnesota. Uh, this has probably changed somewhat recently because uh, all things have gotten shittier everywhere. But I remember growing up just always being taken with how clean everything was and how you know like this was a small were, were these were small towns that were prosperous you know here in the south you didn't you had a lot of small towns that were kind of run down um or that had a that had you know a, a, a good side and a poor side and of course race relations played into that um but up north in in the 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 Midwest, the, the the section of the country that I'm talking about, which I guess would include Northern Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Um, you, you find just it's just this. It was just this other world. It was like, um, it was so well kept. Um, it 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 was. Uh, it, and, and it's not just about race. It's also also about. Or, or or ethnicity uh it's also about culture um i think that these like not just norwegian but i think there's a big scandinavian there's a big swedish uh uh contingent i don't know how many uh how many uh danes or, or finns settled in that region but but there's a big norwegian and a big swedish uh element um and it seemed to me that these are the kind of people who, who had a certain, like, it was like civic pride was a really important thing for them. Um, and, uh, you know, he, they, they were, they had a kind of, mm, uh, you know, a certain, you know, definitely a work ethic, but also this, this kind of, uh, like you know, there's a way. There's a way. There's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. So they could be a little bit on the rigid side. Um, you know, they, they weren't the loosey goosiest uh, types of people that necessarily you would find. Um, the <laughs> the Polish and Italians um, that side they would they'd be more more liable to let it all hang out. Uh, uh, but. Anyway, that that's you didn't you didn't ask about any of that, but that's just interesting things that I that I observed uh, growing up, and as a Euro mutt, you know, somebody whose ancestry is from all over Europe, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, uh, Eastern. Well, Poland is sort of Eastern, I guess it's more Central, but Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting to see those kinds of differences on display. Okay, user WP5NO6CN2B asks, what should I do? <laughs> well, um, and of course, the, the absence of context there is, is hilarious. Um, I would say, regardless of your situation, you should... Uh, well, well, pray. That's one thing I would recommend. I don't know if you if that's something you do regularly, or something you don't do very much, uh, or if you consider yourself spiritual or religious, or or if you don't. But but in any case, I would I would pray to God, and, and if you if you need help, you know, ask Him for help, um, and see what happens. Just see what happens. Maybe maybe nothing will happen. That that you nothing that you're aware of nothing that that you'll be conscious of but maybe something will happen uh but i would also say you should uh seek out counsel from people whom you trust and these can be mentors you know like fathers or uncles or some you know or, or people like that or you know former teachers or or whatever or they can be peers, uh, or they can be both. I would say, think of, make a list of the people that you trust, that you don't mind sharing uh, things with, and and, uh, and talk to them about whatever it is that you need to talk to them about. That's what I would recommend that you do. 
So I hope you will take my suggestion. I think I think uh, you'll be pleased with the results. All right, profit potential five four five seven four zero. See what I like about this is I hear from a lot of people that I don't hear from uh, most of the time. Otherwise, profit potential uh, uh, asks what what are your favorite movies? Um, I've said this in a previous um, Q and A. But it was it was maybe maybe two years ago now. That was the last time I was doing those. Um, I have uh, uh, I, I, I'm I'm a I'm a cinephile. I've I've uh, I've copped to that. Um, I have pled guilty to to that uh, to that accusation. I am <clears throat> an intractable cinephile, and I had there were two main. Um, uh, bouts of cinephilia that I had. The first one was very, very young when I was like, well, I was not very, very young, but like 10 or 11 or 12. Uh, I, I went to a ton of movies around that time. And so I would like, uh, the favorite movies of my youth would be, would be the Star Wars, the original Star Wars trilogy, uh, you know, uh, which I've talked about in, in videos, uh, before. The Indiana Jones movies, the first two Indiana Jones movies, um, and those would be the major ones from my early cinephilia. And in those days, it was all about just you know action adventure, you know cool scenes with battle scenes and fight scenes and and you know quests and good versus evil and all that. I, I, I really dug all that. And then later, as a as a uh, late teen and into my my twenties, my my late uh, my se- maybe starting from my senior year of high school into my college years, I started getting heavy into you know more artsy type of cinema. Um, you know, directors like Scorsese, uh, Coppola. Not I mean like good Coppola, like Apocalypse Now, not 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 crap Coppola. Um, like, unfortunately we, we've had a lot of really since the seventies, um, not so much Kubrick back then. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that was sort of what informed my, my cinema, uh, going by that time. The Coen brothers, you know, uh, even David Lynch, although I had problems with him, um, you know, I, I still enjoyed him for, for being different. Um, so uh, what would be my favorite movies? I always list off Taxi Driver. I mean, I, I've said the Star Wars trilogy, even though I know that they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't withstand scrutiny, but they would still be my favorite. I mean, in all ways, especially not, uh, especially not Return of the Jedi and, uh, and I would say episode four, whatever you call it, A New Hope or Star Wars, also has its has its moments, cheesy moments. But uh, but I, I, you know, my love is undying for that whole that whole original trilogy, and for I would say the first two Indiana Jones movies because they both came in that sweet spot when I was the, a young a young cinema goer. Um, and then movies like Taxi Driver and. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I was I was so big on Scorsese for for a long time. Um, Taxi Driver, Fight Club. I mean, uh, well, well, Fight Club was later, of course. Uh, uh, but I'll just list off some some more, like uh, so Taxi Driver, Fight Club. <sighs> Let's see. I mean, in recent years, definitely Joker. Um, is up there uh, uh, um, among amongst my faves. I would say Apocalypse Now would would be among among them as well, and uh, uh, Jim Jarmusch's uh, Stranger Than Paradise, uh, Whit Stillman's trilogy, uh, Metropolitan, Barcelona. And the last days of disco would also be 
in there. Uh, great dialogue uh, in those movies. Um, you know, wonderful, witty dialogue. And probably a lot more, but I just, I just can't, I just can't, no, they're not coming to mind right now. Um, uh, and you know, I still have a, I still kind of have a thing for the old, the pulpy type of, like the kind of movies that I liked in my youth, but I can't, I can't love those, I can't watch them in quite the same way that I could, I could watch them when, when I was a kid. Um, the most exciting cinema experience of my life was seeing Return of the Jedi in 1983 because there was so much build-up uh, since the the cliffhanger ending of Empire Strikes Back, and you know it was three years later, and there, you know everybody was talking about who's what really happens, who dies, uh, you know, and and all this other stuff, and it was so exciting to see it uh, when I was 12 years old with my friends. Uh, it was it was just the most exciting, uh, one of the most exciting experiences of my life, one of the best days of my life. I know that sounds crazy, and uh, you know, and, and maybe to some of you it's like, oh, uh, you know, you, you you maybe you want to look down on me because it's it's a Hollywood movie, and and uh, you know, you should your bet the best days of your life should be about your family or whatever. I'm just saying. I'm not saying a Hollywood movie is more important than my family. I'm just saying the day on a day that I felt, you know, real joy, uh, you know, uh, was that that was one of, uh, that was one of those days. And looking back now, I'm I'm so much aware of the flaws of Return of the Jedi. Uh, it's a heavily flawed movie, although I still love it, of course. But but uh, it was the. Uh, it was the uh, again, you know, a truly exciting experience for me. Okay, uh, I will leave off there and uh, take this up next time. Thanks for watching.